What's happening, everybody? Welcome into episode 51 of the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that covers everything going on in the college football world. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host, no longer coming to you from Boulder, Colorado. I am in Oakland, California, my new place of residence. Moved out here for work, been out here for about two and a half weeks now. It's crazy. It's a totally different place than what I'm used to, but I am really enjoying it so far out here on the West Coast. Hope you all are having a great week and want to welcome you all into today's show. And before I get down to business, I want to remind you where you can find the show, and that is on soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod, and by going on to Apple Podcast and searching the Two Stripes Podcast. Subscribe there, leave a review, leave me some feedback. You can also do that on Twitter. Give me a follow, give me an at, any sort of comments, suggestions, concerns, whatever about the show at Dubsco. That's D U B S C O. You can find me on Twitter there. And since I'm now in Pac-12 country, what better way to kick off this new era of me doing the show in a different place than by talking about a Pac-12 school and a team that probably should be picked to win the Pac-12 this year, and that is the Washington Huskies. And there's no better person to talk about Washington with than Ryan Priest, who is one of the co-managers for UWDogPound.com, SB Nation's Washington site. Ryan and I spoke on this podcast basically around this time last year and did a preview episode about the Huskies. So I figured it was so good. We'll bring Ryan back on the show and, uh, and talk about UW. And it certainly did not disappoint. I think this is an episode you guys are going to enjoy because we really took a deep dive into Washington's upcoming season and what we can expect from them. Washington is coming off two double-digit win seasons in a row. In 2016, they went to the playoff won the Pac-12, and last year won 10 games. They were about a game away from the Pac-12 championship, and they played in the Fiesta Bowl, a very entertaining game against Penn State. So this is a program that's looking to take that next step, I think, into that upper echelon of teams. And looking at the Pac-12 right now, outside of them, I don't really see any major threats to, to make noise nationally, at least at this point. In April, So I think that this is a super important year for Washington in terms of what the perception is of that program because they are very good, but it remains to be seen if they can take the next step, but they certainly have a ton of talent. They have one of the best coaches in the country in Chris Peterson, and they're going to be very intriguing this season. So Ryan, uh, Ryan dropped a lot of really good nuggets about the team and what their strengths and weaknesses are. The opener against Auburn and Atlanta, which should be a lot of fun. And basically anything and everything else pertaining to UW season coming up. So now seems like as good a point as any to stop this long rambling intro and get right down into the interview. So here it is, my conversation with Ryan Priest of UW Dog Pound about the Washington Huskies. You're a returning guest. You're you're a special guest. This is your I, second I'm time. A known, I'm a known quantity. Yes, yes, you are. You are a known <laughs> quantity. We talked on April 19th, 2017 about Washington and previewed their uh, their season. And we're going to do it again today on episode 51 of the Two Stripes podcast. So we're talking Washington football here with the co-manager for UWDogPound.com. And his name is Ryan Priest. Ryan, welcome back to the show, my friend. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, let, let's get into this because Washington has now, I think, pretty firmly established themselves as, if not one of the top programs in the country and with you know, programs like Ohio State, Alabama, and Clemson, then they're pretty close. They're 37 and 17 in Chris Peterson's four seasons in Seattle. They've had a playoff appearance. They've won the Pac-12. They played in the Fiesta Bowl last year. From the outside looking in, it, it seems like not only is this the highest the program has been in quite a while, but it seems like it's the most stable that it's been as well. What, what's the feeling amongst the fan base about where Washington's program is? Well, there, there's no question that the era of Chris Peterson has uh, been a bountiful one for Husky fans. Uh, you know, we're, we're coming up uh, this year on the 10-year anniversary of the 2008 season, uh, which was the last of the Tyrone Willingham era when the Huskies became the first team in the history of the uh, of the the you know the pack 
you know, 10, 12 conference, et cetera, uh, to go winless in an entire season. Uh, you, you, you don't get much different uh, from that to, as to where the Huskies are now. Uh, so it's, it's been quite the decade of uh, ups and downs <laughs> for, for Huskies fans. Uh, but in, in terms of <clears throat> where uh, most fans see the program going now, uh, I, I think the, the word that I keep coming back to is just foundation. Uh, there's, there, Washington's success over the last you know three, four, or five years of the Chris Peterson era has been built on something that is not just you know one player who's bringing it up who's you know making a huge difference and then it's back to rebuilding mode after he's gone they have talent across the board chris peterson is bringing in the sort of talent that you know he the one of the big questions about him when he got to to washington was is he going to be able to recruit at that elite level and he just brought in one of the best recruiting classes in washington's history uh, in, in this most recent class. Um, so th there's no question that the talent has taken a, a sharp uh, upturn in terms of what's available across the board. And uh, they're, they're, they're well positioned uh, for success for, for years to come as long as this thing can keep rolling. And as long as Chris Peterson is at the helm, there's no reason why it shouldn't. So coming off of that playoff appearance in 2016, Washington goes 10-3, and three. Last season, they finished fifth in S&P Plus. They finished second in the Pac-12 North. And then season ends on a bit of a bittersweet note, or I guess not bittersweet at all, a, ba a bad ending, losing to <laughs> Penn State in that in that Fiesta Bowl game, which, which was a great game. But what was the overall feeling about last year? Because it was another double-digit win season. You know, like you said, the, the recruiting's at its highest level. You have stars within the program. There's guys that are going off to the NFL – but it, it felt like a not not a miss because I, I don't want to say that, but a, a missed opportunity to at least get to the Pac-12 title game, and it certainly had its ups, but it also had its downs as well. Yeah, um, I mean, it, for for all the success that Washington had in 2017, it, it can't help but feel like a season of missed opportunities. Uh, you you had a, a game against Arizona State on the road that. There was no reason to lose that game, but you know what? That's college football. Sometimes you lose games that you have no <laughs> you have no business losing. Uh, and then the the loss on the uh, on the road uh, to Stanford was uh, a difficult one as well, especially considering the way that the Huskies dominated Stanford in that uh, primetime game in 2016. Uh, you know that was definitely disappointing to to see them uh, not be able to pull that one out and to uh, to miss the uh, the Pac-12 title game as a result. Um, but uh, that being said, nothing that happened in 2017 is anything that's like not a correctable. You know, there's uh, a correctable error or anything like that. There, there's nothing to make Husky fans think that oh, there, there's some inherent uh, flaw in the program and the way it's built that's going to keep them from from winning in the future. Uh, you know, just, you know, you had some bad luck in some cases. You've uh, just got some things to clean up in others. Uh, but but overall, it's the, the program is in a place where they should be able to move forward and they should be able to, to do well, um, especially with some of the returning production they have coming back in 2018, uh, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, let's talk about that. The biggest storyline for this season, I guess at least for like national media, is definitely going to be the return of senior quarterback and running back, the tandem of Jake Browning and Miles Gaskin. There's also a ton of production returning on the defense, especially in the back end and Washington dealt with a lot of injuries last year. Wide receiver Chico McClatcher broke his foot in the opener. The Pac-12 opener against CU was out for the season. Left tackle Trey Adams tore his ACL. Cornerback Jordan Muller broke his ankle against Arizona State. Hunter Bryant was out for a couple of games in the middle of the season, the tight end. And then receiver Quentin Pounds also had a season-ending injury. All those guys are back. There's plenty of production back on the defense. You have probably the two best players on offense back in what looks to be a really wide open Pac-12. What are people talking about this season? What are expectations and how are people feeling heading into, I guess, in the middle of spring ball? Well, I would say, first of all, that you just gave a very good overall of the team. I don't even know why you're having me on. Um. That, that's why I do the notes, man. I put like four hours of research into this. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right, man. You're stealing all my talking points. I don't appreciate it. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's my job. <laughs> no, with uh, with with I mean, let let's start at the top with with Browning and Gaskin coming back. Uh, you know, I, I think every Husky fan in 2017 expected Jake Browning to come back for his senior year. You know, as as productive as a college quarterback is, he's not the type of player who's coveted by the NFL, and he's not the type of guy that you would expect to uh, to jump after his junior season. So his coming back is something that Husky fans had uh, planned on virtually across the board. Uh, conversely, almost no one expected Miles Gaskin to be back. Uh, he had a productive, you know, first two seasons that, uh, or sorry, first three seasons, uh, the type that when you see running backs put up those kind of numbers and those kind of stats, you know, just because of how short the shelf life is uh, for running backs in the NFL, that most of them are going to go as opposed to not. So when he declared that he was going to come back for his senior season, that was like getting, you know, a, a six star recruit <laughs> in the uh uh, in the 2018 class um, for, for Chris Peterson's part. Um, so, so that is just a boon that almost no one expected and is going to pay dividends, uh, especially with, uh, you know, former offensive coordinator Jonathan Smith off to Oregon State to become head coach and uh, bring in a, and Chris Peterson bringing in Bush Hamden uh, back uh, to the Huskies um, from his one year stint with the Atlanta Falcons to become Washington's new offensive coordinator. Um he, uh, Miles Gaskin is going to be a very, very important security blanket uh, for um, for Bush Hampton as he kind of breaks into his new role as the uh, the offensive coordinator and the play caller. Um, so, if nothing else, Washington is going to have a an above average quarterback and an above average running back. And in terms of how you feel at the start of the season. Uh, it, it's it's tough to get much more optimistic than that. How are people viewing Browning heading into his senior season? Because last year his yards per attempt yards per attempt went down from eight point eight in two thousand sixteen down to eight point one in two thousand seventeen. He threw for forty three touchdowns in two thousand sixteen. It was down to nineteen last year. His quarterback rating was down by fifteen points, but the passing game overall wasn't bad by any measure. It was pretty good. They finished ninth. In passing S and P plus, they were third in success rate. What's what's the view on him into his senior season, and what what can they do to kind of, I guess, be more consistent in their passing game next season? Well, if if there's anything that's a cause for that drop in production numbers, um, I, I really honestly think it can be chalked up to having John Ross versus not having John Ross. Uh, you know, when when you have literally the fastest player in the history of college football, you know, as in, in the modern era, at least as judged by 40 yard dash times, uh, you, you have him available to take the, the top off of a defense and you have, you know, miles Gaskin to the, the defense that also has to worry about the, you know, down on the box. Um, you're, you're going to be able to, <laughs> to, to get some of those uh, big plays and touchdowns that maybe you aren't going to be able to when he, when he's gone. So, as much as a lot of fans like to complain or worry about uh, Jake Browning's level of production, uh, he's, it's not like he took a giant step back. The offense as a whole took a little bit of a step back in 2017, but you know they, they, they didn't become like a four or five win team. Um, so I, I think a lot of that concern uh, tends to be overblown. Um, Especially when you look at Jake Browning's efficiency numbers, for example, you know, his interceptions went down from nine to five, uh, despite throwing an almost equal amount of uh, attempts. Um, you know, that's the sign of a maturing quarterback and somebody who's getting better. Um, you know, Jake Browning's never going to have that cannon of, uh, of an arm. That's that's not the type of player he is. Uh, he's, he's just got to play to his strengths of being that quarterback who, uh, you know, makes smart, makes smart decisions, doesn't turn the ball over. And is able to, you know, efficiently get the team into those, you know, second and third and short uh, type of scenarios because that's where he lives. More importantly, that's where Chris Peterson lives. And when you have a back like Miles Gaskin and another one like Savon Ahmed and a tight end like Hunter Bryant uh, to 
try to, you know, convert those, those second and third downs. Uh, if, if you've only got, you know, three, four or five yards to pick up on those scenarios, you're going to be in good shape more often than you're not. Yeah, that lack of, or not lack of, but the loss of explosiveness in the pass game was definitely something that stood out. They finished 22nd in passing ISO PPP, which measures the, I guess, the explosiveness of your explosive plays in 2016. That was all the way down to 72nd last year. But like you said, Browning's completion percentage went up from 61% to 68%. What was the offense just not taking shots downfield? Was Browning hesitant? And do you think with that new offensive coordinator, they'll be able to get some of that explosiveness back in 2018, even after losing a guy like Dante Pettis in that receiving core? Yeah, uh, I mean, Dante Pettis obviously is a, is a big piece to uh, to replace, not only as a receiver, but uh, on special teams. You know, he's he owns the the punt uh, return record um, for career NCAA players. Uh, you know, that's not the type of guy you just get somebody to come in and, and replace. Um, that being said, uh, you know, Washington's re- receiving core last year, as, as you already alluded to, uh, not only did they have to contend with the loss of John Ross, but they also had a lot of injuries that they had to deal with. Uh, you know, Chico McClatcher was somebody that we all expected to be a major contributor. And, you know, he's out virtually at, after the non-conference uh, season or, uh, you know, schedule had ended. Um, so getting him back is going to be big. If, if there was anybody that we expected to kind of fill that, that John Ross type of role last year, it was going to be Chico McClatcher. And after he went down, there simply just wasn't anybody to really stretch the field anymore. So we know about Miles Gaskin. We talked about him, him coming back. He's the career rushing touchdowns leader at Washington. He's 52 yards away from breaking Napoleon Kaufman school record. For rushing, but one of the things that that stood out to me about their running game in regards to last year versus 2016 is the second option in Levon Coleman wasn't quite as explosive as he was in 2016. He's gone now, so what are some of the other options for them at running back to kind of supplement what Miles Gaskin does? And what what's the status of the offensive line? How do they look heading into this season? So I'll, I'll start with the offensive line first. Uh, for, for starters, uh, getting the uh, getting Trey Adams to return is big. He he went down with with an injury that ended his season prematurely, and he sat out spring ball so far. Uh, but all indications are that he is on track to um, be ready to go at the start of the season. Uh, when he's at his best, he is a legitimate you know first round NFL draft All American type of talent at left tackle. Um, so if you can get him in there, and you, if you can get a healthy season from him. Uh, you're going to be in much better shape than, you know, 75% of NCAA football teams across the board just by having that. In addition, they also bring back uh, Caleb McGarry at right tackle. So so you got your two bookends uh, that, that are going to be taken care of as, as long as health holds up for both of those players. Nick Harris, uh, is who, who has been a regular starter since his true freshman season, uh, you know, that in in 2016 that uh you know as a true freshman he he took up uh took on the alabama defensive line and while he didn't win all of his battles you know he he held his own and looked like he belonged so uh he he's somebody who's uh has been a, an important part of this offensive line uh, throughout his career uh it, it looks like he's going to be shifting over to center to take over for uh coleman shelton who's uh who's off uh, possibly the nfl and aside from that, there's uh, there's some holes to fill there at both of the guard spots uh, in terms of just knowing who's going to take over. You know, we it looks like uh, Luke Wattenberg might be one of those prospects. Jesse Sosby has uh, gotten a lot of guard reps uh, in his career so far. Wouldn't be surprised to see him become a starter. But they definitely are kind of playing musical chairs at the offensive line there and need to settle on kind of that starting five and uh, figure out the pecking order for, for the rest of the depth chart after that. And uh, so that was the offensive line. I, I'm totally blanking. What was the other part of that question you'd asked? Uh, supplements for Miles Gaskin at running back. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first and foremost there is going to be uh, Savon Ahmed. Uh, he, you know, as a true freshman last year, really showed off his ability to, you know, be a, an important player um even with you know gaskin and coleman ahead of him he's he's somebody who had that speed and agility and burst to really demand getting reps and you've got to be a pretty good player (laughs) to uh to to convince chris peterson to get the ball to you as opposed to uh miles gaskin and yet he he was able to do that 
um, he, he's somebody that I think we can all expect to take on a, an enhanced role in 2018 as that true kind of number two option uh, when, when Gaskin isn't on the field. A couple, couple guys to keep an eye on aside from that. Uh, Kamari Pleasant is a player who probably has the, the best uh, kind of uh, potential to replace somebody with the physique of LeVon Coleman. He's, he's definitely smaller than Coleman, but uh, by just height and weight, he's, he's probably the biggest uh, running back on Washington's roster right now. Uh, he's somebody that got a lot of, you know, kind of garbage time reps in uh, 2017 and hasn't been a, uh, a key contributor at any um, important point in Washington season so far, but uh, he, he's somebody who could, you know, potentially step into that role by the season's end. One of the best secrets in college football last year was Washington's defense. They finish sixth in S and P plus. They were one of the best defenses in the country at limiting explosive plays. They were able to shut down opponents right away on first downs and, it really starts for them, I think, with the with the secondary, and a lot of those guys are back. What what stands out about them? What makes them so good? And is there anything to their process or the way that they play that kind of just I, I don't know? I guess just makes them so good because they are super fun to watch. Yeah, they really are. If if there's one thing that's been consistent about Washington's defense uh, since the start of the Chris Peterson and and more importantly to this point, uh, Pete Kwiatkowski era. Uh, it's that every year we see Washington lose important players and we think, how are they going to possibly replace them? And then they do, uh, you know, in, in, in the, in the second year of Chris Peters of the Chris Peterson era, you know, we were trying to figure out how they were going to deal with the departure of Danny Shelton and Shaq Thompson, you know, suddenly they're better statistically. Now this year, they're going to be dealing with the departures of, uh, Keyshawn Bieria, Vita Vea, Azim Victor, who, you know, Azim Victor's story is an interesting one. We, we still don't know everything that happened with him and kind of what turned his, you know, preseason All-American season into, you know, being kicked off uh, the team by the end of the year. Um, but that, that's a whole other can of worms. But but finding finding players to replace those guys is is a big priority this spring. I mean, first and foremost is Vita Vea. You, you simply don't replace a player like him who is, you know, six feet, four inches tall, 347 pounds, and runs a 5.1 second 40-yard dash. Uh, those guys don't grow on trees. Um, <laughs> I, will, I will say this. Watching him uh, chase down running backs on uh, screen passes is – probably the single thing i'm gonna miss most <laughs> about the, the 20 the 2017 washington defense that was just so fun to watch uh but they, but in terms of the players they do have coming back uh they were very lucky to uh get uh greg Gaines to come back for his senior season um alongside vita vea he was one of the true important uh defensive linemen uh of the last few years uh you know and at six feet two inches tall 313 pounds He's got that body size and that physique to really kind of step into that nose tackle type of role. Um, alongside him, you got Jalen Johnson, who's been an important contributor uh, in terms of being somebody to, uh, you know, like a second string type of guy over the last couple of years. Uh, we haven't really seen him step into a starting role, but he he will certainly get first crack of the apple um, at the start of the season and uh, is somebody that, you know, you, you could see stepping into that role and not being a superstar but being an important contributor and then at the uh, kind of outside linebacker defensive end type of hybrid role that the Washington defense uses. Uh, I expect to see a lot of uh, Levi on Wuzurike and uh, true freshman uh, Tuli Leituli Gasanoa, uh, who is a uh, somebody that he, if anybody is going to step into that Vita Vea role who we don't really know about right now, it's probably going to be Latuli Gasanoa. Uh, he's got that six foot one inch, 338 pound uh, body that, you know, that if, if you're going to go for a true nose tackle type, uh, you know, it, it helps to be almost 340 pounds. <laughs> yeah. On the subject of Vea and that defensive line, one of the things that you guys wrote about in your spring previews was about how the defensive line group right now isn't maybe filled with the big boys in the middle like we're accustomed to seeing the last few years with the Washington defense. And last season, they were consistently not letting teams rip off five-plus yard carries. And that goes a really long way as a game goes on and, and an offense has to 
play in second and eight or third and seven or third and six. So what what's the outlook for their interior? And not that it's a concern, but is it, but is it the biggest thing where it's like, well, we may have to wait until the start of the season to see how this really plays out with the interior of the line? Yeah, I, th- I think it's the latter. Um, there, there's no question that they lost a lot of production off of last season. And, uh, d- you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, Pete Kwiatkowski has – restocked uh the defense or the, the sorry the defense uh every year that he's been at washington um at, at some point that's you know that upward trend has to kind of crest and at some point you're gonna backslide it you know what happens to the best programs or the best coaches it eventually things have to stop getting better um so maybe that's gonna happen this year maybe not you know, we'll, we'll just have to hang tight and see what happens. All right, we're going to talk about scheduling and Husky fans. I swear it's it's going to be good. We're not we're not going to rip on it. I'm not going to rip on it. But I think Washington, whether it's correct or incorrect, fair or unfair, whatever, they've been labeled as a program that has like a quote unquote scheduled a soft non conference. And this season, they start the they start the year by opening up in Atlanta versus Auburn. How important do you think that game is, I guess, for national perception? And how important is it for them to go out and, and beat Auburn? Oh, it's huge. I, I don't think you can overstate that game's importance, especially in terms of the way Jake Browning is perceived. He is somebody who is seen as a good quarterback, but somebody who hasn't, you know, won the big game. And that's because, quite simply, he hasn't. Uh, and, you know, it's it's not fair for me to put that on one player because, you know, football more than any other major American sport is a team sport. Uh, so, you know, the, I, I will admit that is unfair for me to say. But perception is reality in this case. Washington just, you know, they, they couldn't beat Penn State. They couldn't beat Alabama. You know, they couldn't beat USC. It's in, in, in the last two years. They're, they, they have gotten that reputation of kind of feasting on the softies and then not being able to, to hold up with the big boys. So if they are able to go into uh, Aub- or sorry into Atlanta and play Auburn in what amounts to a uh, into what amounts to a home game for the Tigers, uh, that is going to be real important. Um, n- not only for perception of outsiders, but I think perception of the insiders. You know, it, players love to say, you know, they don't read the the press clippings and, you know, they're all about their own internal mentality. But I think you'd be foolish to think that, uh, you know, they haven't started to kind of internalize, you know, some of this perception of them, which is that they haven't been able to, to go beat those big time opponents. And if they're able to go on that road in that, you know, season opener and, you know, not not even dominate, but if they could just you know, hang with them and pull out a win on the road like that. I think that would be huge, not only for the national uh, media per- uh, perception of the Huskies, but I, th- I think for their own self-perception as well. Yeah, and even if Auburn has one of those classic schizophrenic Auburn seasons where they fall back to like 7-5 and five at the end of the year, I think that winning that game, especially to your point, in that location in Atlanta is going to carry some serious cachet if they're able to build upon that in be in the playoff hunt later in the season oh yeah for sure and also i will go back and say that while washington's schedule has definitely been not the best over the last couple of years they've also been unfairly knocked in a lot of respects i think uh you know wisconsin backed out of that home and home which is why they had to pick up fresno state last year uh not, and not even to mention the uh you know the the utter ridiculousness that was ESPN with that cupcake skit, and they're that was just bad. In, they're incessant. They just incessantly bashed Washington like on a game broadcast. It's like, what are you even talking about? Like maybe give a play by play instead of just promoting ESPN's kind of company line that Washington doesn't belong. I don't know. I, I just keep trying to think of like, could you imagine them ever pulling anything? like that uh you know on alabama's sideline while the crimson tide are playing like mercer or something you just can't see that happening and i think that really speaks to the lack of respect that the pac-12 uh demands right now and you know their postseason uh last year certainly didn't help things well and and to that point in the comparison with alabama they had a common opponent in the non-con last year and that was Fresno State, who ended up being pretty good. Yeah, and like really surprisingly good. <laughs> when it came to the playoff talk, you know, as an Ohio State fan, I heard 
all this. Well, Fresno State was really good, and Alabama took care of them, and, and I know that Washington wasn't, you know, in that playoff hunt in the last, you know, week of the season, but I didn't hear anybody reference that game that they played Fresno State and beat them, what, like 48 to 16? So, yeah, to your point, you know, you see a team like Alabama play Fresno State, and when Fresno State's good, it's, yeah, they, they played them, they won, that's a good win for them, but Washington does it, and you didn't even hear anything about it. Yeah, well, I, I think you'd be foolish at this point to think that the Pac-12 is anything but last among equals. Uh, they, they just, yeah, um, among Power 5 conference teams anyway, uh, they just they simply are not on the radar. Uh, you know, maybe USC is, but I, I don't I don't think any Pac-12 team uh, aside from USC and and probably Washington uh, has a realistic shot of getting a, a playoff berth. And that's you know six months before the season starts. Well, if there's one big brand that proved that it definitely does respect Washington, it was this week when Washington locked down a endorsement deal with Adidas, 10 years, $120 million. It's the seventh richest in college athletics right now, and it's Adidas' third largest among their, uh, their, I guess, teams that they outfit at the moment. What does that say about UW athletics as a whole, and uh, how are people feeling about that? Because that's some pretty big news. That's very big news, and it's certainly been dominating uh, a lot of the talk among you know kind of the, the UW sites. Uh, I, I think the first and foremost uh, message that people take away from that is this is a great dig to get in at Phil Knight and kind of the the Oregon brand. <laughs> um, that it's it's funny because you know you, you'd think that maybe the, the the money and how that could go to you know assist in you know renovations or expanding uh, some of the the non revenue sports. Uh, you know you'd think some of that conversation might uh, might come up first, but no. It's, it's all about that that Washington-Oregon rivalry, and this is a great addition to it. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't really looked all that closely at a lot of uh, Adidas' designs for some of the other uh, teams that they, um, you know, outfit. Uh, I, I, believe, I believe they outfit Arizona State and UCLA, maybe another Pac-12 school, but Washington might just be the third. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I'm... I, I really have a tough time getting into that whole uniform <laughs> discussion. It's, 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 I don't know. I'm kind of old school in that respect. It's like, just get on the field and play ball. But uh, there, there's no question that uh, that amount of money uh, that's going to be delivered to them over the next you know decade through that deal uh, really speaks to the respect that uh, the Washington Athletics Program is demanding right now and uh, really shows how great of an, of an investment uh, it was for uh, – you know Scott Woodward at the time and Jen Cohen alongside him uh, to to bring in Chris Peterson when they did. All right, we'll wrap it up on this. Usually I end with expectations, but I'll switch it up and ask you, what do you think the ceiling is for the 2018 Washington Huskies? And then what's one thing that gives you pause about them reaching that ceiling? I mean, ceiling, I, I think, has got to be national championship. Um, you know, I, I don't want anyone to confuse me for saying that I think that's the likely outcome. You know, it, it's it's foolish for anyone to say that a national championship is likely for anyone who's not named Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, but that, you know, with with Jake Browning, quarterback, with Miles Gaskin, a running back with, you know, important talent coming back on the offensive line. Uh, Pete Kwiatkowski still in command of the defense, uh, you know, I, a couple of fantastic cornerbacks and Jordan Miller and Byron Murphy, especially uh, they, they have the talent across the board to win a national championship. Um, I don't know that they have the depth to do that. Um, you know, I, I think that was one of the reasons that Washington didn't meet a lot of their goals in 2017 was that uh, once the injury started to kick in, they didn't have, you know, th th that's what separates a team like Alabama and a team like Washington. Uh, I, I think you could agree that Washington, Washington and Alabama's first stringers, uh, you know, are able to compete on the same field. But Alabama is able to to roll in those second and third string squads that are still yeah. made up of you know four and five star players. Not a lot of programs can do that. Um, so if, if Washington is able to you know get some luck with uh, with health and uh, 
uh, with production this year, especially with you know return, returning important seniors like like the ones I mentioned. Uh, I think the the ceiling is absolutely a national championship. Now, as to what keeps them from that, I mean, first things first, you gotta go to Auburn, or sorry, you gotta go to Atlanta, and you gotta beat Auburn. And more importantly, you probably gotta do it by a couple of touchdowns if you really want to be in that that early season like front runner kind of status that really helps when the uh, when the playoff discussion comes along. So, uh, and and Washington, as we've seen over the last couple of years, they haven't been able to win that big game. So, you know, I'd say if there's one stumbling block, it's it's going it's going to Atlanta and it's winning that game. So no pressure, no pressure in the early season or anything. <laughs> well, and it, sh- it should be a ton of fun to watch them this year. Uh, the S and P projections have them at fourth. So if you're sleeping on Washington, I would advise you to wake up because they are only projected to be behind Ohio State, Alabama, and Clemson this year. So it is very much a possibility, I think, that Washington makes another run to the playoff. And with the Pac-12 the way it is. I think that they are for sure the front runner to to win the Pac-12 and make a lot of noise this year. I'm excited to keep up with them. They come to Berkeley on October 27th, so I'm going to check them out when they are uh, they're they're out here to check them up close in person. And if you want to keep up with anything Washington football, I would highly recommend you visit the best Washington site on the internet and that is uwdogpound.com. You can also follow them on Twitter at UW on SBN and you can follow Ryan on Twitter which I also highly recommend by adding him at Ryan Priest anything else Ryan I I think we covered basically everything I don't know if there's any other Washington podcasts out there but I I think we blew those fellas out of the water man. (laughs) I think we did all right you know what one thing we didn't mention that was a real bugaboo for the Huskies that they'll also have to fix their kicking game was just not the best in 2017 and uh, it, yeah, they, they they missed a lot of uh, field goals that would have given them, uh, you know, at least a chance to pull out uh, those uh, two two losses against uh, ASU and Stanford that they weren't able to get. So shoring up that kicking game, uh, you know, not not the sexiest topic for uh, you know conversation in April, but it's going to be an important factor for them come the season. Yeah. On that note, um, who's who's going to replace Dante Pettis now that like eight punt return touchdowns are, are gone? <laughs> That is a very good question. Uh, I, I mean, S- Savon Ahmed is already out there returning kicks. I don't think he's going to be a big punt returner. Chico McClatcher uh, took a turn at uh, you know some punt returns when uh, when he was healthy in the last couple of years. So I, I think he's probably going to get the first crack at that. But you know, at this point, your guess is probably as good as mine. See, nobody can say we didn't uh, we didn't talk about special teams. Now we we wrapped <laughs> it up and, and just tied it with a bow. So make sure to go to uwdogpound.com. Follow them on Twitter at UW on SBN and follow Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Priest. Ryan, thanks for joining the show once again, man. And uh, we'll have to make it a hat trick uh, during the season at some point. Hey, it'd be my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Always a great time chatting about Washington football with Ryan Priest of UWDogPound.com. Like I said, very excited to watch the Huskies this season. I think that they are pretty clearly the uh, the best team in the Pac-12. I think that it kind of sets up for them to make a run this year. They're the best team in the North, and we'll see what happens in the South, but if you're going to pick one team out of that conference to have the best playoff shot, it's them. So uh, that opener against Auburn, like Ryan said, is going to define a lot about them, whether they get into the playoff or not. You know, I think that that game's going to say a lot about Washington as a program and, and where it relates to some of those upper echelon teams like we talked about. So that game's going to be a lot of fun. Whole season's going to be fun to watch for Washington and keep up with all of that in their season by going to uwdogpound.com. I want to thank everybody for listening to today's show, especially if you are a first-time listener. If you want to listen to any of the previous episodes I did or the future episodes of the Two Stripes Podcast, make sure to go to soundcloud.com slash twostripespod, and you can subscribe to the podcast by going on to Apple Podcasts and searching the Two Stripes Podcast, and leave a review if you like the show. It definitely helps out, and uh going to have a lot more episodes coming your way as we head 
past spring ball and into summer and inch our way closer to the college football season so be on the lookout a lot of fun stuff from the show coming your way so i hope you enjoy it and give me some feedback on twitter too i am at dubs co you can follow me there until next time though i want to thank everybody for listening to the show be on the lookout for at least one more episode this week and then a couple more next week so stay tuned on to your feeds for that but until then my name is colton denning And this is the Two Stripes Podcast.